and we'll start. All right, so today I want to just pick right back up where we've been um, going through. We've been talking about the um, uh, some of the, uh, rightly dividing the Word of God, and we were talking about the Word of God as the authority. The Word of God as the authority is where we have been for the last couple of lessons and the importance of the Word of God. And I want to pick up with that, and we want to try to um, finish a little bit more on where we were on that. So the importance of the Word of God. So today I want to start us in James. Let me get this going here and swap this out. Um, share this screen. Okay. James. James. Uh, we're going to start out in um, the first chapter. And verse 21, James, first chapter, verse 21. And here he is um, giving us some more instruction. We talked about doctrine, doctrine being the things that we use to um, to learn from and, and teach and um, for instruction. And here he's giving us some more doctrine here. And um, we start out with this, Maddie, go in there. Okay. So the word of God, here we go. So we in James first chapter, verse 21 it says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. So he's telling us here, we start out here with how do we save our souls? We start out by what laying apart filthiness. So look at what's what's filthiness? Filthiness is anything that's immoral anything that's morally corrupt. So as we look here at our guide here, let me go back to the exegete the text over here on the side, and we're looking at the filthiness. Filthiness, a state of discredit, shame, because of immoral perfection. So um, <clears throat> remember, this is why we have to have a standard to begin with, because we use this to measure morality. Um, so you always measuring this against a standard. And this is why, number one, like I said, the Bible says, without faith is impossible to please God. We got to have a place that we start at. And we start with that as the word of God. So we believe that this is the inspired word of God by faith. And now that we believe that, then that is now what our standard and our moral compass that we measure everything against. So he said, lay aside all fitness, super fluidity. I was wondering about that word, and I looked up that word. What that word actually means is surplus or abundance. So here, if you know, it's, it's actually being used as an uh, a adjective to the word knowledgeness. So that means that you're going to not only lay aside the filthiness, but also the fullness of this knowledgeness. Naughty being what here? Naughty meaning what? W wickedness, um, from perverted um, virtue and more um, principles from the purposes to evil ends. So it's basically saying that what we're full, we have overabundance of evil things. And we do, why? Because we're in this body that's made of clay and flesh, and this body wants to sin. This body wants to do what it wants to do. So that's why we always, the Bible talks about what we're born in our flesh all the time. You know, you know, um, you know our flesh wants to do things that wants to please it. Our flesh wants to go in different directions. Our flesh wants to say certain things and, and be in certain si situations and directions. But here we always, what? Fighting against that. So here um, is another word study here at the bottom. We talk about the superfluidity of naughtiness. It says a translation which may be common to the attention of indiscriminate, uh, see that, pangeristics. Uh, well, that's what he says here. So he has some more references here. So here um, the reference there is Romans 5 and 17. So it says, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and, and, and of the gifts of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So here, what he's doing here, he's counting the balance of that. So if you have the abundance of, of naughtiness, then he's talking about it being counted with the abundance of what? This grace. Being, you know, so now you have the abundance of this grace, the two but here they were balancing out. So I remember I was talking about sending which one are you you more of or which one are you more full of is the one that you're going to gravitate to. So that's why fasting is important, you know, because we're, we're putting our flesh in subjection to um, to the things that it wants to do. So it's going on here. He, he says some other important things here that I want to get back to. Let me see if I can get this to go back. 
Um, yeah. As we go on here, he says, and receive with meekness the engrafted word of God. So when I think about the word engrafted, engrafted typically means what? <clears throat> here, they give us to the wisdom here. Uh, so here, this takes us to, this is James 21. Oh, we switched versions. So therefore, rid yourself of all the sordidness and rank and rank growth of the wickedness. All I did was change versions of the Bible here. I'm in the NRSV right now. And welcome with meekness, the implanted word that was the power to save your soul. So here in the King James Version, they said there was engrafted word. And then here in this version, they said what well, was the implanted word. So what? If it's engrafted or it's implanted, it tells me, number one, that it was not there to begin with. So that means we have well, we have to make a purposeful decision to do this. This is a daily decision. I know some people think, oh, I'm saved and I'm good. No, this thing you have to walk out every single day. Every single day, I have to make a decision that I want to do the right thing. Every single day, I have to make a decision that I want to live for God. Every single day, I have to decide that, you know what? I want to be married. I want to be faithful. I want to go to work. I want to take care of my children. Because what? We always have the opportunity to make another decision. And I know some people think when we get saved and, and we get to this place that things just kind of go away. It doesn't go that way. It, it can get easier over time to make those decisions, but you still have to what? Make this decision every single day. So again, we keep talking about this thing of decision, decision, decision. So even with meekness, the engrafted word, which is able to what? Save your soul. So how is your soul saved? Because you have the engrafted word. So that word is there what? To constantly remind me of what my positioning is. You know, that's one of the reasons why I like wearing these bands, because every now and then I might forget a little bit. And then when I see this band on my arm, it reminds me of my positioning. It reminds me of who, what I'm supposed to be doing or, or, or who I am. So here again, this importance of the word. Why is the word important? Because the word is what? It's going to save our souls. It's, and notice here it says it's able to save our souls. But yes, it's able, but it's only able to do that if you what? Apply it. You know, how many of us actually read our Bible? You know, and then it's one thing just to read your Bible, but it's another thing to what? To apply what you read. Because what does he say next? Next, down here in verse 22, he said, but be ye doers of the word and not just hearers only, deceiving your own selves. How many of us know people who, I mean, I know a couple of people that come right to the top of my head. I know go to church all the time. They in church, sun up, they in there Sunday morning, they in there Sunday afternoon, they in there on Tuesday, they in there on Wednesday, they in there all the time. But you're hearing all this word, but you're not acting it out. You're not acting it out. You know, our faith causes us to what? That we have to act out so many things. You know, God comes in and he tells you and he puts something on your heart to do and you don't act on it, then what? You just being one of these people they call being a hearer of the word, but not a doer. See, that's the same thing to me. At that point, it's like, you know, you have, in science, we have this thing we call potential energy, and then you have what they call kinetic energy, right? So potential energy is what? All this energy that's stored up, they can do all this great stuff, but it only really makes, it only really is good when it's actually what? Doing it, which when we transform to the kinetic. So a lot of us as believers, we sit back and we collect all this stuff. We get spiritually fat, but we don't ever use it. And, and I think we're at a point in time now, it's like we're at a place that we have to exercise our faith. Some of us, that might be because of fear. You know, fear of the ridicule that might come with that or the fear of being of standing out. Because you, 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 know, you may stand out and, you, and it's going to cause you to take some risk. Absolutely. You know, I was thinking about a conversation I had last night with a young lady and some of the things we was talking about, you know, and um, this lady is, a, uh, how I want to say it, a openly um, homosexual. And I was having these conversations with her and we was talking and, and I was learning from her and getting perspective from her and she was getting perspective from me and I could see the word of God just engrafting in her and some of the things, and you know, and you just love people where they are. You know, I grew up in a time where people just got, kind of got beat down about stuff. And, and I've come to the point of understand in God that God, he loves us all, but he don't love all the things that we do. He loves me, but he doesn't, I know he don't love everything that I do. 
So we had a point now what? I know where you are, but I'm going to love them through it. And it's through that love. So what I do is like, I live life before her. I treat her right. I make sure, you know, I, I do things, you know, that's right by her. But at the same time, this is where the line is drawn. I don't, I don't blend that line. And she knows that, and I and I and she respects that. But now I'm in my simple position, so that what? Now when that seed of doubt comes in, what if I want to change my life? Now I put myself in position to say, okay, if this person wants to change their life, now they know who to come to. Because there's a lot of people around us all the time that want to change their life, or they want somebody to talk to, and they don't know who to talk to because we as believers either we've been hiding our light, or we've not been authentic. And we've come across that we've had it right all along, that we've always done it right, that we always had things in place. Do you see what I'm saying? So some of us, since we have not been as authentic, and, and the reason we've not been authentic, because it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost you something to stand out. And I've seen some of that cost sometimes. And no, it doesn't feel good, but I'm telling you that it's what? It's worth it. You know, when you get the calls and you find out that how people's lives are being changed. Now, and that's what it's really about. You know, like we were there on Sunday morning, and on this Sunday, while we were there at church, just to hear the testimony of the word of how God is working in Brother Jonathan's life and how he's working in Sister Belinda's life and all that. That makes it worth it. So you have to make the decision to say, is this brother or sister worth me making this sacrifice? And I'm telling you that they are. I'm telling you that absolutely they are. So what? Also, so he goes on here, he says, not only being hearers, but deceiving your own selves. Meaning here what? This is us looking in the mirror. When you take time to look in the mirror, you can see things on your face. You can see things that others may not even notice because it's you. you there all the time. But, but it, being a hearer of the word and, and not a doer is like looking in that mirror, knowing that there's something that needs to be fixed, and you decide not to do it. It's being that you know that you got something on your forehead here and you just say, well, you just walk away. You walk away with it on there. You know what to do because you got the word, right? But then you don't act out on it. So being a hearer is like, like I said, looking in that mirror. You can see it. It's brought to your attention, but you rather not act out on it for what various reasons. And this is what he talks about. These being what? A hearer of the word. I mean, I'm being, not being hearers, but not doers of the word that you are deceiving your own selves, meaning that you're making yourself like, no, well, I'm not going to do it just because I didn't. It's kind of that thing like, uh, how I want to say it, that, you know, I see it, but I don't want to deal with it right now. I don't have those moments. So I got it, but I really just don't want to deal with it right now. And we just kind of, as we used to say in the country, kicking this can down the road. At some point, somebody has to pick this can up. At some point, a decision has to be made. So we asked ourselves, when is that decision going to be made? He says, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding himself, what? In a glass. That's that mirror we're talking about. But for he beholdeth himself and go his way and straightway forget what manner of man he was. Meaning you look and you forget even how you look. But whosoever look into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word. This man should be blessed in his deeds. If any man among you seem to be religious and bright of not his tongue, but deceiveth his, but deceiveth his own heart, that man's religion is vain. So you know how people go around talking about, well, if you do this, you give me this money, you give me this, you're gonna be blessed. The Bible is already telling us, look, if you if you're doing here, if you're doing this, you're gonna be blessed. Do I believe in giving? Absolutely. You know, we got to have, we got to give to, you know, to do the things that we need to do. But that's not just part of, because see, if you, if you out here and you're looking in this mirror and you realize there's some things that needs to be changed, if you're working on those things, then you're not worried about the rest of it because those things are part of it. You'll fall in line because, you know, the Bible says what God loves a what? A cheerful giver. So the reason I'm going to give is because I'm already in love with him and I want to do it. You think about it. Many of you have spouses or people that you love. I don't know about you, but I like to please my wife. I like to see her happy. Part of my goal is I want to see her as happy as possible every single day. So sometimes that, that means that I do things that I necessarily didn't want to do, but I did it. Why? Because I wanted to make her happy. You see what I'm saying? Um, or maybe I didn't necessarily want to spend this money, but I spent it because I wanted to make her happy. I want her to be pleased with me. And when she's pleased with me, then what happens is 
I, I, I find that it's a lot easier for me to get the things that I feel like I need or I want. Do you see what I'm, you see what I'm saying? So it works the same exact way. So when I'm spending this time, you know what I'm saying, trying to please my spouse, then in turn, she what? She makes sure that I, I have what I need because she's happy with me. And it works the same exact way with God. You know, he's saying, what? Well, if you keep my commandments, if you be a hearer of my word, I mean, if you be a doer of my word, not just a hearer, then what? These things please me. Therefore, what? You are blessed. Now, how, how would I look that you, you made me happy and, and you're doing what I asked you to do and you're keeping my commandments and you were and you in lack? I'm not going to make sure that you're not in lack. What I'm going to do is make sure that you have what you need. Because I'm going to make you happy because you're making me happy. So what happens is now you have this continual circle of happiness. And we always working. This is what, you know, we used to sing this, this song in the old trace that you can't be God-given, no matter how hard you try. So, okay, I, I did this for God. And then he'll end up doing this. And you're like, no, I want to try this for God. And you do that. What? Then he do something even greater. Then you're like, oh, man, I got to do something better. And that's a, it's like an internal competition. This is why, what, our marriages... What? Post a, ma a mirror, what? The marriage between Jesus and, I mean, Jesus or God and the church. Do you see what I'm saying? If the church is doing what? Things to please the groom. Mm -hmm. So what does he do? In turn, he does things to please what? The bridegroom. Makes sense? So now you got this thing that's going back and forth all the time. So what? This way he comes out, he says, what? He's looking for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. This is what he's looking for. This is what he wants because, wait, he's giving himself as the ultimate sacrifice for her. So the least she can do is what? Have herself ready and be righteous and be ready to receive him. And we are all part of that body. We all play a role in there, whether you're a sail or whether you're a toenail or whether you're, you're a piece of the tongue or the ear, whatever the case may be. The body of Christ, we are all a part of that. And this is why our physical marriages, what, they're supposed to mirror the marriage between Christ and the church. Am I, am I, am I helping somebody? So this is, this is why it's so important for you know, us to get this thing right in our marriages, right? So, I mean, we're not happy all the time. I'm not happy all the time. You know, my wife is probably upset with me a lot. And I probably do things to make her upset, just like she do things to make me upset. But what, then we have this point of what? Reconciliation, right? You know, I forgive her, she forgive me. We we get over this thing because what we love each other, and then we come back together, and then what? Now we go forward. Same thing here. So this is what you talking about being a doer of their word. And he said, if any man who seems to be religious and brought him not his tongue, but deceive his own heart is religious is in vain. He said, pure religion and unfilled before God. And the father to this to um to this to visit the fatherless and widows if in in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. All right, so let me go to the next scripture I wanted to go to. Matthew. Today we are going to Matthew seven and thirteen. Matthew seven and thirteen. And it says this, enter ye, so now we're still talking about this, what? This importance of the word. It said, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the, is the, um, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in there, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto light, and where few there be that find it. All right, so what is he saying here? And you notice these are in red. So these are words that have been given credit to Christ. Saying that, first of all, when the gate is wide, destruction is everywhere. It's easy to get in that path. It's easy to get into to destruction. It's easy to fall into all this. Because you know, the gate is wide. Anybody can just walk in there. It's a broad way. So broad is the way to destruction. Meaning that what? There's various ways. There are many ways to find yourself going to destruction. It doesn't take much for us to find our way to destruction. We can come out of the womb without knowing anything and find ourselves in the pit. Right? Because we was born into sin. The Bible tells us that. That we're born into sin and then what we back and redeem but through him, through the relationship through him. And we have to go through what? Through the son to get redeemed by the son to be able to even see the father. 
But then he comes back and he tells us that, but what many will he said, many there will be which go to the um um they're at. Meaning that it's a lot of people are gonna go that way. But straight is the gate. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. So what that what all these so remember I was telling you all a couple of weeks ago, I was telling you all about my one of my favorite shows, which was that thousand ways to die. And remember, but it was a thousand ways to die, but it's only one way to live. Think about all these ways that you and I could be taken out. We saw some people, unfortunately, you know, that died in this boat this week. That's horrible. But well, it's only one way to live. And this is what he's telling us here is that it's the same thing. It's one way to him. And that way is what? Through Jesus Christ, his son, to be crucified with him. That's why baptism is essential. Right, you get baptized, then you go down in the liquid grade. To now, what you you referencing that is the liquid grade. Then you come up, which is the power of what the resurrection, because all the power of Christianity is in what the resurrection. Without the resurrection of Christ, we have nothing. That's the difference between Buddha, Muhammad, all of them. They all say they live, but he only Jesus is the only one who came back and came back on record to be able to tell us that he came back and gave us authority and gave us power so that's why we have the power we have it came through what it came through the resurrection mm -hmm. so then he says this he said beware of false prophets so everybody who's claiming to be a prophet don't mean they ain't a prophet but at the same time there are some false ones out there he said which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are raging wolves so what, there are people who come, they come to us and they sound good and they hit all the right things and, and they somehow they, they speak in some tongue and all this kind of stuff, but inside they might just be greedy. They might just be in it for selfish gain. And what I have found is if you want to find a wolf, you got to feed a wolf what he really wants. Mm -hmm. You know, see, that's the hunter in me. It's like, we bet, you know, when, if I want to kill a wolf, I bait him. Because at some point, his instinct is going to take over. So observation is really, really critical in a lot of these things. A lot of these things, we just got to exercise some patience. A lot of us just have to exercise some patience. I know, you know, I, I can be very impatient sometimes. And I know a lot of us can because we want what we want when we see it. But sometimes it requires us just to sit back and just be patient and see how things kind of play out. And if it's for you, it'll be for you. But over time, you'll see certain things. You'll start seeing characteristics because you know what? They said you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all, some of the people all of the time. Do you see what I'm saying? So if they fake it or if they that, just stay back and watch. Because the Bible also tells us what? That we know them by their fruits, which is what? The next verse. He says what? You should know them by what? Their fruits. Do men gather grapes or thorns or figs or thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth what? Good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Well, last time I checked, when you look at fruit from um, trees, what? Trees have to, you know, if there's a tree, it produces something. Is it, what kind of fruit is it producing? So again, this is this thing of what? Don't be in a rush. The Bible talks about it. Don't be in a rush to put, lay hands on any man, especially when we start talking about ordaining. Um, he tells Timothy this when he started ordaining elders and bishops and all this kind of stuff. Why? Because you need them to prove themselves. See what they are. You know, I tell people sometimes, you know, I, 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 try, I said, go look at my timeline over the last, I've been on Facebook probably 10 plus years and all this stuff. Go look at my timeline. See if it's not seeing the same thing consistently. You know, there's growth and you're supposed to be growing, right? But nothing stays the same, because if it stays the same, then it's dead. But at the same time, you're looking for this consistency of thought. Do you see what I'm saying? Because then you'll see some people, they'll start out with this, and then they'll be over here, and then they come back over here, and then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, well, I'm done with this, now I'm doing this in this season, or I'm done with that. Christ is looking for what consistency in our lives. This is how you can tell, observe, and sit back, and watch the consistency, and see what kind of fruit is being produced. So he talks about a corrupt tree. He said, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. It's also like that verse that says what? You know, you heard people say bitter and um, sweet water cannot come out the same fountain. Right? You know, they, hot and cold water, you know, we will not the same fountain, but if they come out at the same time, what happens? They're lukewarm, right? 
If hot and cold water comes out at the same time, we get lukewarm. And we've already talked about that. Lukewarm water does nobody any good. It's actually usually pretty bad. And that's where things like to grow. So either you what? The Bible, he talks about what? Either you're hot or you're cold. Or if you look warm, I spew you out of my mouth. So again, over and over again, we see this. He said every, t- every tree that, that bring it forth not good fruit. Let me slide this up here a little bit. Every tree that bring it forth not good fruit is, he- is hewed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by the fruit ye shall know them. So this is Christ talking to us. By the fruit you should know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of the Father, which is in heaven. Many would say unto me in that day. This is when he's talking about the day of judgment. What would they say to me on that day? So the day of judgment, remember we talked about it. It's going to be two books. You got what? The book, you know, your name is written in this book of life. And he on that day, he's going to pass judgment. And he said, in that day, they will say, Lord, Lord. We not prophesy in their name. We got people walking around saying, in the name of Jesus, this is this, and this is this, and God told me to tell you this, and God told me to tell you that. Then he said, and in their name has we not cast out devils? And in their name um, done many wonderful works? And will then, will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. That's a bad thing to know that you think you've been working for God all your life to know that you've been fired. You know, I, I heard Brian Corn say this one time, and I, and I used it. He said, he said one time, I saw him teaching, he said, God is one of the only, he said, God is one of the guys that, that allow you to work and, and allow you to keep working and you've been fired. That's a bad situation. You, you working and you've been fired and you don't even know. So he said, what? Well, cast them. These are workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So everybody who's hollering that they know God, everybody that they, they hollering that they have a relationship with God, he's saying what? He's telling you how to find out about them. You'll know them by their fruits. So that's why I, I got to a point in my walk. You know, I grew up, I'm apostolic, and I'm still apostolic. I believe that. But I got to a point, I see a lot of people walk around talking in tongues and doing this and doing that, but then they can go here and go cuss the neighbor, go out here and do these things to the, to on the, you know, the wife or the, or the wife can do these things to the husband. So I had to stop and I said, Lord, I need, I need a sign. And he said, look, you watch them by their fruits. Cause there's some, I never heard speaking tongues at all. Don't mean they ain't saved just cause I didn't hear it. But what, what they produce, apples, trees will produce apples and fig trees will produce figs. So, I want us to be a, a church that when we look at, I hear what people say, but I really want to watch what they do. Do they do what they say they, they say they're going to do? Do they follow through? This is what he's talking about here. Because in time, you will be able to see these things. As you know, they, they used to say, time will always tell. Time will always tell. So then he says here, say what? Therefore, whosoever these sayings of mine and do with them, I will liken unto him a wise man, which has built his house upon a rock. Why rock? Rock is what? Steady. Also, rock here is also translated as what? Peter. So the name Peter actually means Petros, rock. And then he tells what? Upon this rock, I should what? Build my church and the gates of hell should what? Not prevail against it. So he said, well, I'm going to build my rock on a rock. I have solid foundation. And then he says this in verse 35, 25. And the rain descended. And the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a what? A rock. So that rock is what? It can be in there. It can take the pounding. See, when your faith is built on, and your faith is solid, your faith is built on a rock, things are going to happen. That's part of life. You know, we all going to go through some things, some things that we're not going to like going to happen to us sometime. But it's like through all of that, this is where you find out where your faith is. Your faith built on the rock? Or is it built on something else? Now, do we get points in time that we question our faith? Absolutely. I do all the time. Like, Lord, is this really? But me questioning my faith and me abandoning my faith is two different things. I question most things. I encourage you to question most things. I see this. I'm like, Lord, I don't know about this. Because if this is what it is supposed to be, it can stand the test. I don't have any problem with people coming to question us, you know, uh, you know, uh, about anything. Why? Because if this is it, it can stand the test. The word of God will prove itself. 
You and I don't have to do anything. It'll prove itself. And it'll prove itself over time and time and time again. But, you know, so it's nothing to run from. I encourage you. Because if not, then if it's, it's got some holes in it, I need to know because I need to figure out this is where I want to stand. Do you see what I'm saying? So this thing, he talks about it being built on a rock. And then he goes on and says, and everyone that hear the sayings of mine doeth them not shall be like unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. So remember what did we start at first? We start out in James, right? In James, he talked about what? Being hearers of the word. I mean, not just being hearers, but also being what? Doers of the word. Do you see how these two verses are now tying in together? So that's why we started at James. James, we started at James because he was talking about, you know, those people being hearers of the word, but not doers. And now you see what? Now Jesus is coming back and saying the same thing here in Matthew, talking about, well, if they're going to be doing it, then this is what they their child do. And if not, then they what? Like into a foolish man who built his house on the sand. What's the problem with the sand? The sand, it'd be nice and level, but as soon as the water come, it's going to wash it all away. So what happens is we have some people who've, whose faith is not built on a solid foundation. So when they get a little trouble, it's washed away. When something don't go their way, it's washed away. When people ridicule them, it's washed away. When a, when a little financial thing comes and shake the house, it's washed away. Why? Because it's been built on sand. This is the problem when we have what I call gimmicky ministry. Gimmicky ministry. What I mean by gimmicky ministry? We can go invite Tasha Cobbs to the church. It'll be packed out. People are there. Are they there to hear Tasha Cobbs? Or are they there really for the word? Do you see what I'm saying? And you and I, we probably, we all know churches like this. So then what? The next week, I got to go invite Todd Gibbons so I can keep the crowd. The next week, I'm about to have Kurt Franklin. The next week, I'm probably about to have um, Brashawn Mitchell. The next week, I'm about to have um, um, Shirley Caesar. And the list goes on. Do you see what I'm saying? Because people now, they come to this thing where they're getting entertained. It's not about the faith. Does that make sense? And we have people who get stuck on gimmicky stuff, right? You know, I got some people who get stuck on personalities. Well, I just like the way he teaches, and I like the way that he preaches and this kind of thing. And then what? Now you get stuck on this personality. So what happens when this person goes away? Because we all go away at some point. What happens when the good time ends? Now, if your faith is built on that, if your faith is built on, you know, on, on just how Peter lives and Peter messes up, then you're going to be done. And we've seen this time and time again. This is why he says, well, our faith has to be what? Built on that rock. That rock being who? Jesus Christ. Because if our faith is not built on that rock, then when man fails you, then you'll fall miserably too. Do you see what I'm saying? So think about building. So think about you building on these things, right? So if I'm if I'm building on this, if I have this here and I'm building on this, I need this part to be the rock. Because what happens is if this goes away, then what? What I have is gonna go away too. Because there's nothing for it to stand on. So this is why we have to be what? Built on a solid foundation. This is why we have to decide that look. You know what? For God I live, God I die. Yes, I, I, I love Pastor Pete, and he's been great, and he's been wonderful, however, he's not my God. Because we should all be at the point that, you know, when God says it's time for you to go to somewhere else and do something else, that you should be able to go and do something else. We can touch and be reverent. and I would hate to see you go, but I want to respect the call on your life. I want to respect the call or the anointing that God has put on your life to do ministry in other places. Because it's not just about being at the safe house. This is just what? A place of training, a training ground for you to go out and do what? Be disciples to other people. Just like God has called me to be here. So it's not about me, but it's about you and your relationship with him. And together, we walk this walk. Together, we're here to encourage one another. Together we're here to walk through this. Because if not, then what? It's built on sand. So if it's built, if your faith is built on my faith, and I, in the beginning, I, I get it. You know what I'm saying? In the beginning, especially with young believers, I mean, that's could be expected. But as you become more seasoned, as you do what the Bible says, graduate from milk to meat, you should be able to get to the point that you can stand on your own two feet. You get to the point that you'll be able to defend the gospel for yourself. And if things come to shake you, and, and, if, and if I do something stupid, 
Then it's like you just don't throw God out. It's like, well, he just like the rest of them, I thought. No. And see, that's what we're seeing more and more today, that we have so many people from church hurt to all these other things, and that they built what they thought. They built it off the pastor, or they built it off the personality, or they built it off the praise team, or they built it off the, the music ministry, or they built it off the mind team, or they built it off the Ursha board. They found their, their self in that stuff and not off the rock. Am I helping anybody tonight? So you want this stuff to be what? Built off of the rock. Because the rock is the thing that's not going to change. I'm human. You're human. Things change with us all the time. But the rock stays the same. The rock is unchanging. The rock is unmoving. The rock is the rock. He says here, he said, which is built. Uh, where did I go? Um, he said, uh, and the, the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and upon and beat upon the house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock and everyone that heard these sayings of mine doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which was built his house upon sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell and great was the fall of it and it came to pass when Jesus had entered and um, ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his what? Doctrine. Doctrine being what? His teachings. Remember, we're following what? Strong doctrine. Teachings. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. See, this is different between authority and the scribes. So what are the scribes? The scribes are the people who just writing this stuff down. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's one thing. It's so how I want to put it. When you've been given authority to do something versus when you've just been put in position. Let me give you, I'm going to try to give you an example. Let me see if I can think of something real quick. All right, as a, like for instance, as a person, if you're an interim person in a position, so say for instance, you're an interim, in my case, like I'm an interim department chair. You're put in a position there to do some things, but you might not have full authority. And what do you mean by that? Meaning that they expect you to hold some things together. They expect you to put some stuff, but as far as making some really strong decisions and, and they stick and you don't have that, you don't have that power. Therefore, you, act, you kind of work under this premise of that, I'm doing this, but is it okay for me to do this? Versus somebody who comes in a, with authority, they don't even have to second guess whether they can do it or not. They just do it. And so many times, we as believers, we work as scribes because we don't know the authority that God has already given us because we don't understand the authority that God has given us. So as we read this word and as we understand this word, well, we find out more and more that we have what? We have power of life and death. Because mm -hmm. he told us that power is where? In our mouths, in our tongue, that we have faith, that we have the faith of, if we have the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, he said what? We speak to the mountains and the mountain has to move. He told us by his stripes that we were healed. Uh-huh. All these things that he's already given us authority over, do we say them with authority or do we say them as scribes? That's a question you have to ask yourself. You know, do you say them with the authority that I know God has given me the power of this and he's given me the power of that? He's, you know, he's not giving me the spirit of fear, but a love and power of the sound mind that he's given me vision. Or do you say it from, oh, well, I just read about it. You know, so it's okay. It's the difference between walking to that door with authority and walking through that door to just ask them for permission. So one, like the scribes ask kind of more like for permission and, and he talks with what? More in the authority. It's kind of like when somebody walks in the room, you know who the leader is. But I'll even them sometimes saying they have a certain walk about them. There's a certain, certain, certain way sometimes they almost carry themselves. It's sometimes clear who the authority is when they even walk into the room. And this is what they were saying. So when they saw this, they saw him that he was that authority. Matthew 16, we'll say Matthew, I'm going to 16 and 18 through 19. 16, 18 through 19, and he says this. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So now we just went, what, in verses 7 through 13, um, 
about um, Matthew 7 and 13 through 27, he was telling us what? Jesus was talking about this rock. And he was telling you that, wait, he builds his church upon what? This rock. Or that he would build anything he's going to build, he build it upon the rock. Why? Because if you don't build it upon the rock, if anything comes, then it'll this way. It'll be washed away. So now we go down what? A couple of, couple of chapters down to verse chapter 16. And then he tells you what? Now he's establishing the kingdom. He's establishing the church. And he's telling you what? I'm going to build this church. Mm -hmm. And he's building it on what? On the rock. Therefore, what? It cannot do what? It cannot fail. And the gates of hell shall what? Not prevail. It didn't say that it wasn't going to try. Like you and I. I tell you, I uh, mean, and, and I remind you all the time. Things are going to happen, y'all. Things are going to happen that we're not going to like. But he didn't, he's not going to win. He didn't say that it wasn't going to come. But he said he's not going to win. And that's what you and I got to live in. That's what you and I got to remind ourselves on each and every day that this stuff is going to come, but he's not going to win. Because at the end of the day, I don't care how bad it gets and how bleak it got. Somehow, God, you're going to pull this out at the bottom of the nine. The bottom of the nine, two, two, uh, two outs and three balls and two strikes, and I got one more to go. And all of a sudden, now we're going to tear. I have to believe that. My faith tells me I have to believe that. I have to hold on to that. Because without faith, it's what? Impossible to please God. You know, think about the woman who had the curse of oil, and, and she, you know, it was her faith that fed Elijah. And she kept feeding him from it, because she was like, well, we're just going to get him, we're going to make this little meal, and we're going to die. And the Bible said, what? It's not going to run out. And then what happened? Every time she went, the Bible said, what? There was more there. And there was more there. Some of you looking at your bank account say, Lord, well, well, after I pay my tithes, and I, and I pay this, and I pay that, it just don't seem like it's enough. I'm telling you from a living witness, it's been more there. Lord, well, my wife and I, we look at, we've been putting our stuff in, to, you know, trying to, you know, put, you know, to get this church going and all this and that, and things have been short sometimes, but it seemed like all of a sudden we go back, there's more. This came through. I got this long. I mean, not this long, but I got this business situation came up. And it, God continually opens up doors. Got a promotion. Got a raise here. Got, it's always been something. He's always providing, and I'm not just paying that lip service, but I'm telling you something that I have lived. You know, right now, we're we building this home, and it seems like it's just taking forever to build this home. It's this going on, and it's that. And then the building won't let us do this, and the building won't let us do that. And you know what? I'm reminded, I think Frederick Douglass said it like this, without struggle, there is no progress. Anything worth having, you have to what? Somehow you got to struggle for it. There is some kind of climb on that. And it's the same for your salvation. It's the same for your life. It's the same for your job. There is some kind of mountain that you have to climb. But then after that mountain, what happens? You know, if you ever, you know, my wife and I, I took her down to Kitty Hawk a couple of years back with some of the students I was working with. And I remember we was down there in Kitty Hawk. If you ever been down there on Dare Island right now, I mean, well, you don't want to be there right now. <laughs> it's getting crushed right now, right? Or about to. But if you ever been down there, they have these nice old sand dunes where the Wright brothers um, flew their planes at to start learning to flight and all this kind of thing. And I remember them dunes, first of all, the sand was like extremely hot because we was there like in the middle of the summer, like July. It was like 100 degrees. The sand was really hot. And, and we was climbing those dunes. And, you know, it was just so hot and hot to get to those dunes. But when we finally got on top of those dunes, and you could just see for miles. It seemed like you can see the whole coastline of North Carolina from the top of those dunes. All that struggle, all that work, all that climbing. You know, when we got to the top of it, we forgot about it. Because the breeze was there. You know, it, it was a coolness there. And it was what? It was worth the climb. And that's what we got to remind ourselves that, hey, it's going to be worth the climb. When I see new brothers and sisters step foot through the safe house doors, it reminds me that it's worth the sacrifice. It's worth the climb. It's, it's worth the serving. You know, when I see brothers and sisters growing in their faith and able to step out and witness to other people, it's worth doing the Wednesday nights. No matter where we got to do them and how we got to do them, it's worth that. So we have to what? Walk in there with the spirit of expectation that God is going to do these things and that what? The gates of hell is not going to prevail. It's going to come, but it's not going to prevail. And he tells Peter this and he said, And I will give unto thee the keys of the um, kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you shall bind on the earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you shall let loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. So what does he do to Peter? He gives Peter. 
authority. Remember, we were just talking about that. So he gave Peter this authority. So that same authority that he's given to Peter, it's the same authority that he's given to you and I. It's like we don't understand who we are. You know, Maya Angelou had a poem that was a couple years back, and she was a saying, it was saying that, you know, one of the things is about us is that we, we fear ourselves that we might be way greater than we ever thought that we would be. So, so many times, you know, we see ourselves in this one place, and we see ourselves in this one shell. You know, even I, you know, I got, I finally got my letter that, you know, my official letter that I had been promoted to full professor, and I sat there in a, in a minute, I ain't going to say I wanted to cry, but I thought about it. I never saw myself doing that. Ever. Yeah, you know, I was a I was a middle school teacher and and it was just but what happened was my faith, mm-hmm, my faith with God's will for my life, because even though it's God's it could be that was God's will for my life, I still had to do my part. Because God will, I gotta step out in, on faith. You know, I stepped out on faith, we did some things, and, and there was some struggles, and there was a couple times I didn't think I was gonna make it, and God this what. As we, we took the steps, what does he do? He undergirded, he undergirded us. He undergirded us. When Peter walks out of the boat, Peter doesn't see anything. Jesus said, come to me. And everybody's looking at Peter like, what are you about to do? And Peter, the Bible says what? Peter walks out the boat. And as long as he's focused on Christ, what does he do? He continues to walk on the water. But as soon as he takes his eyes off Christ, what happens? He starts to sink. When we start comparing ourselves to others, well, you know, when they got a new house, I ain't got a new house. Why ain't I got a new house? I pay my tithes and offering, and I obey God. God has a plan, and you got to follow through on your part, too. So we got to be careful, you know, in this day of people comparing themselves to each other. This is stuff would drive you crazy. Because there's always going to be somebody who's going to have something better than you. It's always going to have somebody who's going to have a better house. It's always going to have somebody who might be a little smarter or whatever. But you got to learn how to work within what God is giving you. So I call it putting on them. You ever seen the horses at the horse race? They have these things called blinders on. If they didn't put blinders on those horses, they would never finish the race. Because the horses are what? Those are they social creatures. That horse don't want to run the race. He want to be out there talking to the other horses. So they put these blinders on. So what? The horse doesn't look to the left or look to the right. All he can do is what? See straight ahead. He hears the other noises. But all he's doing is what? He's focused on the goal straight ahead. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters tonight, that we need to be focused on the goal straight ahead. That God has called us to do some awesome things. You know, some of you, you know, all of us have these gifts. And some of you, you know, I gave you, I gave you the gift test last week. Hopefully you, got, you found a little time to start to play with it a little bit. And start to find out, God, where, where do you have me right now in this point of my life? What giftings that I have are manifesting themselves strong right now? How do I learn more about these giftings? How do I learn more about what I'm doing in my positioning here in the kingdom so that I can be effective in what it is that you've called me to do? I'm not asking you to do anything that he's not called you to do. All I'm asking you to do is do what it is he's called you to do. Let us know what it is and let us support you in that work. Because we are all ministers of the faith. We all are. But we have a support team. See, this is what's different from what everybody else said. Here we have a support team that we're going to support each other. Because it ain't about me. I'm just one of the ones. And you are too. I'm just one of the ones. And you are too. So this is why it's important that you go what? That you, that you read and that you understand it and start to study and understand your gift. Understand where God has you so that what now you can exercise that gift and go out and do these things that He's called you to do. Last verse, and I'm gonna stop and you know, my time is up. Matthew, no, not Matthew, first Peter. And I give y'all these verses again before we get off. First Peter um, 1 22 through 25. First Peter 1 22 through 25. And it says this. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Now, notice here. So, hopefully, y'all see how we, I'm lining these verses up. You see how it's growing? So, we start out with the first verse tonight. What was we talking about? Setting aside stuff, right? So, when you start setting aside stuff, what are you doing? You're purifying. Then, we went from setting aside to doing what? Being a hearer. Not, I mean, just from hearing, start doing. So what? Setting aside is what part of the doing. Then we follow up again when Jesus was talking about what? 
me in the doing. And then after you start doing it, he said, okay, well, if you're going to do it, let me tell you how to do it. Do it where? Upon a rock. Mm -hmm. So now he shows you how to do it upon this rock. And now we bring you to this point that now you what? You've been purified. You start doing the work. Now you're building the work on the rock. And now you started building on the rock. Now he's about to give you the next part of that. Do you see the progression? This is what? Strategically laid out. Mm -hmm. This is not just me going all over the place. We have a strategic plan the way this is laid out to be able to pull you progressively so you can see how these things line upon line and precept upon precept. It says, see and purify your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto foreign love of the brother. See that ye what? Love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of the corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is what? Grass. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass willeth and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word of the Lord, which the gospel is preached unto you. What is he saying here, brothers and sisters? Simply saying this, that you and I was born of what? Corruptible seed when we first came to this world. When our parents conceived us and we came here, we was corruptible seed. And then what? We, we are born, then we're what? We're born again into what? Into Christ. When we're born again into Christ, then we become what? Incorruptible seed. Because he's telling you what? If you're, if you're corruptible seed, then you're flesh. And if you're flesh, then flesh is what? Grass. And what does grass do? Grass don't have enough water. It don't get enough sunlight. It does this thing because it withers away, right? It dries up. It crunches. And then it's good for nothing but the burn. But then he said, with well, the man that's a, what? Is a flower of the grass. You ever seen grass when you let grass get long enough? What happens? It starts to sprout flowers, doesn't it? Think about it. You see them little grains and things on top? Those are actually flowers. Because what is it trying to do? The reason a grain will sprout a flower is because the flower is what? That seed. And that seed is what? When that seed is planted, what does it do? It's a incorruptible, I mean, it's a corruptible seed. So corruption does what? It breeds more what? Corruption. So when this flower of the man is grown and it becomes the seed, now it's what? Now the seed is in the ground. Now the seed is in the ground and it brings more corruption. So therefore what? At some point, you have to be born again so that we get rid of what the incorruptible, I mean, we get rid of the corruptible seed into the, what the incorruptible seed. Do you see what I'm saying? This is what happens. So if you don't break off this progression, it just keeps doing what? Making something after its own kind. This is why corrupt people hang out with more corrupt people and even more corrupt people. It just builds on that because there's nothing else there to break it. But Jesus came in and said what? But the word of God, Hey, all that's going to happen, they wither away, and then it recycle. But the word of God does not wither away. It's the same, and they endure for forever. I had someone I was talking to me the other day say, yeah, the Bible's cool, but it needs to be updated. I'm like, I looked at them like, what do you mean? Updated. Well, you know, the stories are not, you know, you know they're, they're not this and they're not that. I'm like, no, I don't know what Bible you read it. Let's have a conversation. Because I can show you in Revelation where some things are going. I can show you in Daniel where some things are going on. Ezekiel, you know, Isaiah, must we continue? You know, so if it's not there, I mean, these things are what? It's the living word. So therefore, I can read this Bible a hundred times, and I'm going to see it a hundred different ways every time, because some of my interpretation on my spirit at that point is going to determine, is also going to be determined on how, how I'm feeling at the time, what I'm going through, what my prayer life is like at that time. Because I, if I'm not praying, I can read it, and it's just like, oh, that was an okay story. But when I'm praying and, and I'm fasting like I should be, what happens I read that same story, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God, it jumps off the page. Y'all ever been, you ever been there? Think about it. I, I, try it. Try it. Just read it. Just find a nice little story you want to read. Find it, read it. Make mark of it. And then go, go somewhere and fast and pray and come back and read that thing. <laughs> the same exact story. Go fast and pray and come back and read that thing. That thing, I'm telling you, that thing changes itself completely. It's not the same word. And this is why the Bible talks about what? Things of the spirit does what? It begats other things of the spirit. That's why he said what? He that worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. So this is why some people are confused with the Bible because they're just reading it like a storybook. And if I read it like a storybook, then it, yeah, it don't make sense. But when I read it with my spirit right, 
that thing changes things. That thing set me on fire. That thing gives me hope. That thing inspires me. That thing gets me excited. See, I'm getting excited right now. Woo! And I got to stop. And I told you I was going to stop. So I'm going to stop. My hour's up. God bless you all. I love you all. I hope that this has definitely been a blessing to you all. Um, I will put this back out on the um, on the um, <clears throat> the web. I haven't uploaded those yet to the YouTube, but I am, and I will do it real soon um, when I get a, um, this opportunity to do it. I guess based on when I go back to work or something, who knows? But because um, my internet connection here is not fast enough to do that, but um, I'm just grateful um, to you all. And um, as we go forth in this, um, please feel free to share this link with everybody. It's the same link every single um, um, every single Wednesday. And um, I just look forward to continue um, working with you all and going through this tonight. The nice verses, for sake of those who would like to have them, we have James, first chapter, verse 21 through 24. Then we were Matthew 7, um, chapter 7, verses 13 through 27. Then we went over to Matthew 16, verses 18 through 19. And then I was finishing up there on 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25. God bless you all. Love you all. Hey, we would love to have you at the same house. If you're not already a member there or if you just want to come by and visit, uh, what we get, hey, I don't add to the word of God. What you see is what you get. It's just a, a group of people here that's loving God and trying to get others to come along with us to support us in doing the work of God. And uh, we just want to take whatever your gifts or your talents is and just use them and use them to, um, to the magnification and the glory of God. God bless you all. I love you all. Hey, you all be safe in the storm. And we as we pray for those who are in harm's way, that God bless them and first um, responders, et cetera, et cetera. So you all take care. Have a great day. Thank you all. I love you all. And, um, and have a good one.